I'll introduce myself. I'm Nick Keith, the Executive Dean of Science here at Birkbeck. I bring the apologies of the Master, Professor David Latchman, who unfortunately is ill today and cannot come to introduce our annual Rosalind Franklin Lecture. This is part of the Birkbeck Athena Swan Initiative. For anybody who doesn't know, Athena Swan is a UK and Ireland scheme to promote equality in science. Things have improved much since Rosalind Franklin was at King's and wasn't even allowed in the senior common room, but there is still are inequalities of gender, race, and many other things in universities in, in the UK. And, and so we have set up this annual lecture by a distinguished female scientist to, co to come in and talk in one of the areas that both research excels in. And I don't think we could have chosen a better person than Professor Ava Nagalis to give, give this talk, particularly as this is the year we open our latest electron microscope. So Ava did her undergraduate study in her native Spain in Madrid. She then came to the old Des we think John to do a PhD with John Bordas on sac scattering from tubulin. I think I met her there when I was also a, a student. She then went over to the US to work initially with Ken Downing on tubulin, this time by electron microscopy, which proved much more successful. And then rapidly she set up a group on her own. She became a Howard Hughes investigator and is one of the leading electron microscopists in the world. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Ava Nagalis to give this year's Austin Franklin lecture. So thank you, Nick, for the introduction. Funny to think that I, uh, that you were in the good old days, in the good old Dasbury, um, when things move a lot more slowly than uh, they move now. And thank you, Gabriel, for inviting me, and um, especially to give a, a, a lecture like this. I don't know if I deserve it, but I take it. Uh, <laughs> And I want to take this opportunity to just thank two other people that happen to be in the audience um, that were very important for me during my PhD and postdoctoral studies. One is Helen Sable, because you have to realize that when I was starting doing CRIEM during those years, and I went to conference, there were very few women. But Helen was there, and he was among the top dogs, really doing cutting-edge studies on Groyel, and that stood with me, and she served as a role model. And the other one, he doesn't know, but it's Ken Holmes. Because I was trying to obtain the structure of tubulin and microtubules, and that was the time when Ken obtained the structure of actin and using fiber diffraction proposed a model for the actin filament. And that, for me, again, gave me hope and also set the standard I said, we have to do it for the other cytoskeleton uh, system. So thank you, both of you, for that. So Ken didn't talk about actin. I'm not going to talk about microtubules. Half of my lab works um, now for a number of years on uh, large complexes that are involved in human gene expression regulation. And that's what I'm going to be telling you about. And to be more precise, I'm going to tell you two stories. Hopefully, I'll make, you to, make it to the end where I have the the unpublished results. One concerns the epigenetic silencer, PRC2, and the other one concerns uh, a basal transcription complex that uh, is involved in the transcription initiation that Phil was telling you about. So uh, let me uh, just remind you that all these studies uh, are using cryo-electron microscopy, and this is a method that allows us to go from soluble uh, proteins that are happily in a hydrated state, um, diffusing around, doing their business, if they are microtubules assembling, if they are uh, enzymes catalyzing reactions, and then we, in this state, we thin them and we plunge them in, in a potent cryogen and we generate a frozen hydrated sample that we can now study by electron microscopy and that really will hopefully um, reflect the equilibrium state of the complexes that we are interested in. Um, so, case two, sorry, I, that is from something else. So, the case one, <laughs> um, I want to tell you first about the polycom repressive complex two or PRC2. Um, this is a complex that has four core subunits 
and, um, that are shown there, and has as a role to catalyze this reaction, which is the trimethylation of lysine 27 in histone H3. And this um, post-translational modification of histones give ultimately rise to compacted heterochromatin that is silent, where transcription factors cannot reach. Um, and this is very important. It set up whole plans of gene expression that are very important to determine cell differentiation and maintaining that differentiated state so that even though cells all have the same genome, they end up having very different functions in, 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 uh, in, in our body. And of course, when that um, pattern gets disrupted, uh, the differentiation occur and that is a cancerous state and PRC2 is very commonly either overexpressed or mutated in cancers, so it has become a major uh, cancer target. In any case, of these four core subunit, ECH2 is the, one, is the one that has the methyl transferase activity, but that activity is regulated by other components. For example, EED um, has as a role to recognize that trimethylated lysine 27 and activate ECH2. And it's thought that this is important for the propagation of the silent state uh, because it will make um, the complex more active in regions that already have that, that modification. Say, for example, once uh, the cells go through replication and that modification has been diluted, those regions will quickly recover um, that silent state through uh, the uh, spreading of the modification. Um, now, those four core subunits never exist in the, in the cell by, by themselves. They always in partnership with additional factors in some combinatorial manner. Two that have been uh, quite uh, well studied are ABP2 and JAREC2, which uh, can exist by themselves or both together uh, in cells. And they contribute also to activation of the complex and likely also to its recruitment to chromatin. Now, the complex also interact with additional histone modifications. Some of them are activating, some of them are repressive. Uh, so, all together, um, the result will be either a complex that is active, uh, modifies chromatin with this uh, trimethylation, and ultimately results in this compaction and silence regions of the genome, or the inhibition of the complex uh, it means that that modification will not exist and then it is possible for chromatin to exist, exist in an open state and be transcriptionally active. So um, we started working on this complex uh, some years ago and this is pre-direct electron detectors um, when the size of this complex which is just around 300 kilodaltons was already you know at the time kind of challenging especially for ab initio studies uh, by Crow em so we did negative stain. And Claudio, who's uh, now at Genentech across the bay from me, um, uh, expressed and purified the complex in insect cells, the four core subunits, and he found that that complex was very, very flexible, and it was impossible to really get a structure. So he went back to the biology and decided to add one of these cofactors, ABP2, and that gave rise to a complex that was stable enough to be able to do some negative stain, and together with Gabe, um, who's now at Scripps, they obtain a cryo-EM structure at 20 uh, angstrom resolution, and they were able to even propose a model of where the different domain of the different subunits were by using a very clever method of adding either uh, N-terminal, uh, N or C-terminal MPPs or GFPs that were placed at different locations internally within the molecules. And they came out with an arrangement that I, I will, you know, if, if you remember this, was extremely accurate. And it really tells you when you do good work, even if it's a lot resolution, is really very informative. In any case, for, um, for a number, we published this in the first issue of eLife, so Randy Shackman was happy with us. And for a number of years, this was all the uh, structural information of the large complex um, of, of this complex that was obtained, otherwise there were little pieces, until um, two different crystallography groups obtained the structure of the top half of the complex, first for a, a thermal fungus and then for, for human. And this was very good because it actually, they obtained several structures and one of them was an active form in which they could see 
the uh, activating peptide, so they've added uh, trimethylated lysine um, 27 but from the H3, and they could see it bind, they could see how a certain element that they call the stimulatory response motif, or SRM, became stabilized by binding on top of the peptide, otherwise this region was disordered and invisible in the crystal, and in turn, that element interacted with the, uh, the methyl transferase domain, setting it in the right conformation for, active, um, for, uh, for the complex to be active. Um, but of course, of a fully functional complex that has six subunits, they basically had just the ECH2, the W, the EED, and one uh, small piece of the C terminal SUS12. And as a goal for our cryo em studies, we wanted to obtain that of the full complex uh, with, with a full set of coactivators. And that is the work of uh, Viknesh, who's a postdoc in the lab. Um, he obtained many uh, structures at resolutions that were just barely four and a half angstrom, which was not sufficient for us to do our initial tracing of the rest of the components until um, he was a able to successfully use the faceplate. This really helped in the alignment, helped the, helped the 3D classification that allowed him to sort out different states and also to do uh, 3D classification to better visualize movable regions within the complex. So at the end, he had a structure at an average resolution of 3.5, although uh, the, cent the central parts are, are better, and he was able to generate a model for the complex. And something that happens very often when you do cryo-EM and you're not limited by the constraints of the crystal, is that he was able to see that the complex coexisted in two states. And these were very interesting. So this complex is actually active. And it's active because it's bound to a trimethylated peptide, and it's not something that we added. This is a peptide that comes from Jarret 2. Jarret 2, one of the cofactors, happens to be a substrate for PSC2. And because he, because he was um, co-expressed in insect cells where all the cofactors for the reaction are present, he, uh, the, sorry, he, it will get attached to this protein. Uh, it was um, trimethylated and it was bound to the allosteric site. Um, so both of these are active. We call the first one the compact active or California state, and this is one in which the you can see the stimulating pe peptide, you can see the SRM stabilized, the set domain in exactly the same conformation uh, that was shown in crystallography, um, and this, this helix leading to this uh, sand domain is bent and the sand domain is tacked in. In fact, uh, this part was very much in the stigma of this top, top part from the crystal structure of the human complex. Uh, the details of our, of our structure showed that in this case, the peptide is recognized exactly in the same, sorry, the trimethylated group is recognized with the same uh, hydrophobic pocket um, that they were seen for the trimethylated lysine uh, from histones. Uh, but we see a second state, what we call the extended active, because it also has the methylated uh, peptide, it also has the set domain in an active state and bound to substrate, but it's missing the SRM, so the SRM is unstructured, and this, uh, this helix that was bent in that state is here is straight, and um, this subdomain is kind of uh, flopping in the, in, the, in the breeze, okay? Um, so this straight SPD will become relevant in a second. Every time I see a complex that is in more than one state, to me, that's a nuisance for a structure, but a great opportunity for regulation. So I, every time I, I see that, I say, okay, we're, we're dealing with difficulties, but it sure has some biological meaning. Um, okay, so uh, just um, because I want to cover a lot of ground, I'm not going to go at, uh, about a lot of detail, but I just want to show you one particular thing that was very interesting. So this is the region of ABP2 that we are able to see. So that's the second cofactor that I was telling you about. And I want to concentrate in this, uh, in this region, uh, on the C terminal end. And that uh, tend up to, so this, this is the, the model and the map um, from EM. And it ended up to, um, to include residues that are basically, again, mimicking histone tails on their binding 
to the second, the second, uh, second WD40 domain. So the ED is a WD40 domain that recognizes trimethylated peptides, and this IBAP48 is another WD40 domain, but that binds to unmethylated histone folds. And uh, this was a surprise. It's interesting that ABP2 mimics that unmethylated histone tail. The, there had been a crystal structure of just this WD40 domain bound to a peptide, and basically we can superimpose that with ABP2. So both cofactors that act somehow to regulate the, the complex under, uh, under certain conditions are both mimicking um, histone tails uh, and interacting with the complex in a way that is mimic, uh, that mimics the, the interaction with nucleosomes. So, but I want to move on because Having the structure, we wanted to go further because we wanted to know how does PRC2 interact with chromatin. And it's very interesting because this, is, this complex has very, very poor activity for peptides. It has better activity for mononucleosomes, but it really has great activity for dinucleosomes. And we wanted to look at that interaction, but also we wanted to maybe get some structural insight into how can it be that PRC2 can spread that silence state is, is spread the, the, the methylation process. So this is work of another postdoc in the lab, Simon Popsel. And what he did was to create dinucleosomes that were very, very interesting because they corresponded to the boundary condition, if you want, of that silence uh, state, where he uh, put together two nucleosomes, one that was unmodified and will serve as a substrate for the complex, and one that was already trimethylated and in principle should act as the allosteric activator. Uh, and then it, it got them, put them together. Um, he could see that the complex bound to it very well uh, by EMSA. He also did negative stain and it looked really good. So he could see um, the PRC2 and he could see two nucleosomes nicely bound to the top of the complex. So now, the dirty secret, secrets of CRAO-EM. Um, there are many, many cases in which your purifier complex is beautiful out of there, your size is cushioned, you do negative stain and things look really nice, and then you try to do CRAO-EM and everything looks like shit, okay? And it's because, oops, this is being recorded, very bad. Uh, this is because uh, complexes are exposed to the air water interface, which is an infinite sink and these tend to do bad things to proteins, like unfold regions, um, disassemble assemblies, and things like that. And PRC2 happens to be one of the complex that is really, really tricky. So we have to do two things to get the structure that I just showed you before. One is to cross-link it, and we use BS3, the same that we use for cross-linking mass spec studies. And the other one is to use a carbon support uh, we use that very often in our transcription studies to concentrate the complexes because we get very, very little amount. But also, by interacting with the hydrophil uh, hydrophilic surface of the carbon, it is a little bit less likely that then it will interact with the second interface, which will be an air-water interface. But in here, in this case, we couldn't do either of them, okay? We couldn't cross-link and we couldn't use open holes. Um, and we had, sorry, we had to use open holes. The no cross-linking is because every time we cross-linked, we competed away the binding to the nucleosomes. And we could even preform the complex. If we added the cross-linker within the time that it takes us to make a grid, um, the cross-linker had competed away um, the nucleosomes. And when you see the structure, you will understand why. And also, we, we couldn't use carbon because we just got this structure this image all the time. It was absolutely one orientation. Um, so we had to just bite the bullet. We knew bad things were going to happen, but we have to do no holes, no cross-linking, and this is what we got. Some good news, you see, we see nicely the DNA, we see the two nucleosomes, but we don't see the full complex. Fortunately, it all worked out for us. So this is the, the structure that we obtained. Um, this is the top of the complex. It corresponds very much to the part that the crystallographers crystallized in the first place. Obviously, this is the more, most stable part of the complex and is the part that in, also interacts with the nucleosomes. And we see the two. 
we can, uh, we see them, this is just the view that I was showing you. This is the view that I was showing you for the negative strain. This is the sh view that I was showing you for the cryo EM uh, class averages before. So we know that this is the substrate nucleosome, the unmodified. I'll show you why it goes straight. The tail of the H3 goes straight into the active site. And we know that this is the modified one because the tail of the H3 goes straight into the allosteric site. If we, so this is a complex that doesn't have ABP2. Sorry, it doesn't have Jared 2 It just has ABP2. It's a five uh, subunit complex. Um, and we also got the cryo-EM structure, a quick cryo-EM structure of that one. And you can basically put the two together by superimposing the top to generate a model. Okay, so the, the, the binding of these nucleosomes have nothing to do with the bottom half of the complex. At least this configuration of a uh, one methylated, one unmethylated does not uh, interact that uh, obviously with the bottom half of the, of the complex. Okay, so let me show you uh, again the details of, of those interactions of the tails. The tails are flexible from the core of the nucleosome into the active site. We can see them if we play with the threshold. Um, but in any case, you can see this is the H3. We, we just docked in the crystal structure for a nucleosome and docked in our EM structure for, for, the, for the complex. And this is where the tail H3 will, uh, will end from the modified nucleosome. And then this is the one that we see bound, stabilizing the, the SRM, uh, just like uh, it happened in the crystal structure for the peptide, but now directly interacting with the nucleosome. Um, and on this side, Again, we'll have the H3 tail coming and basically where the end of the, in the crystal structure will be here and then it goes into the active site. The resolution here is about uh, seven angstroms or so. So um, if we look at the structure that I just showed you, that is the five subunit complex and it doesn't have nucleus and this is how it looks in this region. I kept the ribbon diagrams, but there's no density for the allosteric peptide. There's no density for the SRM and the active site is empty, okay? So these are really the tails coming from the two, uh, the two nucleus. Uh, now, the, the, the complex is flexible, and uh, we did here the same thing that Phil described, where you can uh, mask out part of the complex that is moving around and then refine this region, and that allowed us to improve the resolution, so you start to see like the bumps in the phosphates in the DNA. Uh, and then we looked at the details of how that DNA contact happened. So if you, if you turn around the structure, you can see that the DNA, so all the contacts with the nucleosome are through the tails, of course, and otherwise the nucleosomal DNA. Okay? So there's no interaction with the famous acidic patch on the histones. It's all through the DNA. It's all through positive charges, path, positive patches uh, in the complex, as I'll show you in a second that are competed away by the cross-linkers that we use. Okay, that's why we couldn't use cross-linkers. In any case, you can see the contact is with the CXC domain, which is part of ECH2 and leads directly into the set domain, which I am always showing in blue. And the contact is here is um, with the two, two groups in, in the DNA. And if you look um, if, in, in the major group of the DNA, and you can see uh, when you put the structure of the PRC2 into the density, uh, that it really corresponds, the, the, the footprint of the DNA corresponds exactly with these beautiful uh, tracks of positive charges um, in the complex. If we look at the other side, so how the, uh, so that was the interaction with the substrate um, nucleosome. If we look at how the complex is interacting with the modified nucleosome, one of the things that we see is a lot of motion. So we can use classification and this is the range of motion that happens. This is the major binding site, and then the, the nucleosome can kind of roll in and generate a different type of contacts depending on its, its position with the EED. These are two, just two different views. And notice this SBD is a straight. So the straight SBD is the one can do, can, that can make that major contact with the allosteric uh, nucleosome, the one that is serving for uh, the activation of the, of the active site. Again, we can look at the electrostatics, and again, you can see in this case that allosteric, uh, that interaction is with the two gyres of the DNA, and you can see 
these positive patches both in the SBD as well as in the ED that are involved in that interaction. Now, were we super lucky choosing the Linka DNA to allow us to see the two nucleosomes so nicely engaged? Because this doesn't happen in the, in the nucleus. In the nucleus, there is a range of spacings. So to check this, we did sub several, but I'm going to show you one that is the most dramatic in which we changed the Linka DNA by five base pairs. That's exactly half a turn. That will move things around quite a bit. Can this bind? And the answer is yes. If you look here, they seem like they're looking the same, they're, they're binding the same way. And of course, this is the trick. The trick is that there are two tricks in here for, for engagement. One is every nucleosome has two H3s. And for in this particular case, is binding to the H H3 that is by the side of the exit of the linker going into the other nucleosome. And in here is binding to the alternative, uh, is binding the, the nucleosome on the alternative side and engaging the other um, H3. These together with that kind of rotation that, uh, that, uh, that is allowed within this re uh, region means that it can accommodate all, all this variation. And we could, if we go a whole um, 10 base pairs, this nucleosome just separates um, doing that rocking to, uh, to incorporate one more ten, but the binding is the same. So this complex can really bind in this way a multitude of, of distance between nucleosomes. And the structure tells us that this double binding means not only that when the complex is engaging a nucleosome, it is in an active state, but that binding of one nucleosome positions the other. So it's not just the activation, the, the K-cut, if you want. It's, the, it's also the fact that it's bringing the substrate in the right position to be engaged by the active side. So I think this was quite meaningful. So I'm just going to move and I'm going to show you something um, in which we, that we've been working on for many years, since I joined the Berkeley faculty in 98 and Robert Tijan uh, convinced me to work on human TF2D. So you've already seen uh, a, a similar representation uh, in, in Phil's um, slide. This is a simplified one, where the only thing that is in here is the general machinery. So it's the polymerase with itself is, is a large complex of half a million Dalton. And then the rest of the basal transcription or general transcription of machinery that have just two roles before even any regulation occur. One, to bring the polymerase to the transcription start site. And in the case of, human, of the human promoters, it really brings it to the transcription start site. There's no scanning like happens in yeast. And the second is to open the, the duplex uh, DNA through the ATPase activity of, of TF2H. So just for that, this huge assembly has to be formed. The first complex to arrive here at the promoter is TF2D. TF2D contains the Tata binding protein that binds Tata box uh, promo promoter sequences. Uh, but additionally, it, con it contains 13 TBP associated factors or TAFs that are involved in everything in else, binding to other core promoter sequences that are not Tata, which is the general case in, in human promoters, interacting with cofactors, interacting with um, gene-specific activators, repressors, histone modifications that are present at active core promoters, uh, all of that. It binds to the DNA with the help of 2A, and then it recruits through interaction with TBP, TF2B, which itself interacts and recruits the polymerase which come to the mix together with TF2F and then the last 2E and 2H join in to form the final active pre-initiation uh, complex. Um, so uh, TF2H itself is also a, a large complex of 10 subunits that has a dual role in transcription initiation and DNA repair. So TF2D, polymerase, TF2H, very large complexes, there's not yet a very effic efficient um, heterologous overexpression system, and we have to rely on purification of endogenous materials. So we grow huge amounts of HeLa cells because these are rare complexes, especially TF2D, and then we use right now immunopurification 
uh, to obtain this. So this is a huge amount of work uh, that is done in the lab by Jay, Jay Fan. Um, so essential for us to do our studies. So we have not yet studied all of this. We simplified um, by basically substituting the whole of TF2D by TBP and working on a Tata based core promoter. And the work which was done by Yuan, uh, who is now at Northwestern, um, was um, used this strategy to be able to work with these tiny amounts of, of sample and reconstituting active DNA engaged complexes. Um, he biotinylated the, the core promoter DNA, bound it to a streptavian coated magnetic beads. And then he could add uh, transcription factors up to a certain point in the assembly of the PIC, incubate with the DNA, then wash the excess and release the DNA bound complexes using a restriction enzyme that cut off the, the DNA from the beads. And then, again, in the era of the in the era before direct electron detectors, where we were being limited to about 12 angstrom resolution, in order to be able to interpret our maps, we build them one by one following the biochemically known assembly uh, pathway. So he started with a complex that contained TBP, 2A, 2B, and Pol2. And this was good because it gave us complexes that we purif you could purify in this way, but also they were crystal structures for homologs or, or, or even human uh, proteins for all of them. And we could just dock in the crystal structures and explain fully the density. Then he added one factor at a time. And from here on, there were less and less of, uh, of crystal structures. So this was, uh, this was TF2F. And he saw a conformational change, engagement of the DNA, and extra density that he could explain with crystal structures. Then he added TF2E, so extra density, not much there, some models that more or less fit it. And then he added TF2H, again, a huge uh, complex, and, uh, and he was able to get that final structure. And within uh, TF2H at a time, there were homology models for the two large ATPases that he could dock in. Um, since then, of course, the, we obtained direct detectors, and he's been able to collect much higher resolution data. And this is uh, on different uh, states. And this is, for, a, for example, an initially transcribing complex where you can um, now model the, the structure in, in atomic detail. This is the active site showing the DNA, the RNA, the non-template DNA, and other el structural elements within, uh, within the active site. Um, and because he was doing this for different uh, states, uh, he could come out with a morph, uh, a, a movie, uh, interpolating uh, between those states that showed how protein and DNA move through the process of bubble opening and initiation of transcription. OK. So, uh, so this, that was very cool. We were very happy. But you have to realize that in human promoters, it is very rare to have canonical tata boxes. So most of them rely on very strong um, downstream core promoter elements. Uh, but in all cases, TBP have to be loaded into, into the promoter to initiate this cascade of interaction that leads to the recruitment of the rest of the transcription factors. So the whole key is TF2D. And this is really what the reason why we started working on transcription. But it is really the most difficult complex that we've ever uh, studied. And it's because of this. So not only is TF2D the rarest and the one that obtain, we obtain in the less concentration, but it also happens to be very flexible. So you've seen some examples of flexibility before. So this is a complex that is 1.2 megadalton in size. Um, we had characterized that it had three major domains. We were very um, original with the names, so that we call them A, B, and C. And hopefully you can see that the B and C uh, what we call the BC core is fairly stable, is not, is kind of, it has the kind of flexibility that you've seen so far. But then it is a lobe that is about more than 300 kilodaltons that move by about 120 angstrom. That is what I call flexibility, not a little loop or a little domain. This is a real killer. <laughs> okay, so this, this is a bit of a nuisance for structural studies, but again, it has to have a biological meaning. It has to be there for something. So this is the APO complex. Uh, and Mike, who now has his own lab at Michigan, when he was a, a biophysics graduate student in the lab, wanted to quantitate things. So what he did 
was to plot the position of low bay with respect to the BC core. And it's a continuum, but it's a kind of bimodal uh, continuous distribution between what he then called canonical and we can call now repress and, uh, and a rearranged state. And the thing that was really exciting and told us this has a biological meaning is that when he added DNA and TF2A to the mix, he saw this shift in the population. So now the rearranged state is very much predominant. And when he looked at the structures, he saw that the, it is the rearranged state that is able to bind to DNA. And it's very obvious that in this canonical state, the, the two binding sites for the DNA do not exist. Uh, this, this does not exist here, and the other one requires the whole rearrangement of low bay to the other side. Okay, so this was obviously pre-direct electron detector. It's true, true globology of about uh, 35 angstroms or so, because really we didn't have a single state. This is a, a whole continuum. So we've done better since then. And this work of another uh, biophysics graduate student that is now doing his postdoc at uh, John Hopkins. And the idea was, first of all, to use the same trick as the PIC for purification of just the DNA bound complex, and the other to use the direct detector and the processing that the new improved images allowed him. And just by using the direct detector and this purification, he was able to get a complex very strongly bound to DNA, because we are, we are selecting for that. And hopefully you can see that of the yellow part that moves, he only really sees this part that is bound to the DNA, and uh, uh, we know this is the downstream, and so it has to have uh, TBP in there. Uh, but that otherwise, the rest of the lobe has become really flexible, and we can hardly see it. We have to play with the threshold to, say some, to see something. So what we do is, again, we mask that part out so that it doesn't blur the alignment of the rest of the complex. And when we did that, he got an improved structure. And then it turned out that this point and this point are hinge points, and there's a motion like that. So again, he masked this region one more time, and he was able to improve the map to get sub-nanometer resolution, which is a cool a structural regime to be in because you can start seeing separation of alpha helices. So in this structure, he could take the crystal structure of TBP2A and Tatabox that had, we've had, for many, uh, uh, had been reported many years ago and fit it right in. And then with the improved map for the C lobe, he could take the crystal structure of TAF1, TAF7 that had previously obtained, um, the crystal structure of a homologous of TAF6 in a dimeric form, um, and then uh, found out that TAF1, uh, TAF2 is, has a structural homology to a class of uh, amino peptidases of all things. Um, that have lost the, the active site, but otherwise has been reutilized um, to now be this module. And with this, we were able to define everything that interacted with the DNA, being TAF1, TAF2, and the TBP itself. So just to thank the people uh, that did the work and are finding uh, funding agencies, so Simon and Vignesh for their work on PRC2, uh, Jay for the pu purification of all these complexes, Yuan for the uh, PIC, and these three heroes that really have to deal with the most difficult complex you can imagine. And thank you very much for your attention. real time. We don't have real time. We have no rate whatsoever. We can, if we, if we are very hopeful, we describe in an equilibrium, but the rates are completely invisible to cry in. How fast these things move? No. So that is just taking different class averages, superimpose them on the BC uh, core, and then see how, how that lobe moves. So it gives us the range of motion, but not the speed. The speed is just the number of, of classes that I superimpose. The sequence of the motion is the one that makes physical sense because it's a continuum. So I'm not, I don't expect the, the lobe to be here, disappear, appear here, and then there. It's a physical, there's a path. So it, it is, we think we order it in, in the right way. So Just, yeah. 
just uh, Yeah, so the, the, what we call now the um, inhibited state is one in which lobe is more closely engaged to the rest of, the, uh, of, of, um, of TF2D, then disengages and it samples the space in something that is very much, I would say, like a harmonic motion. That's like we see a bimodal thing where it goes into two states, the most extreme and the two most extreme ends are the ones that are a little bit more populated, but it's a continuous. So I, I'll see it as a harmonic motion where there is a detachment and just a sampling. Um, by the way, we think that there's two tethers. If there was a single tether was, that was a link up, this thing would be going like this, and there isn't, so I haven't told you this. But we're pretty sure, this is part of the story that if I was telling you just about that Abby's work, I would have been able to go into is that um, the concave part of TBP is known to be bound by uh, the N-terminal tail of TAF1. And that serves a part of the inhibition so that the TBP uh, doesn't just bind to any piece of DNA in, you know, when, it's, when it is not uh, really the, the right time and, and, and place. Um, in any case, there is that tether, so TAF1 is left behind, but there is this tether to TAF1, and there's the tether to TAF6. Maybe there are more, okay? Those tethers are flexible, they're there, the lobe never disengages, okay? There are covalent interactions leading all the way to the tether. But the tethers are such that the motion is very much directed, so it's not completely random. Yeah. The speed. Right. Obviously, the, this uh, your question is 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 great, but it's not a question that I can answer based on other structures. But one thing that is is worth pointing out, because some of you may say, okay, you're telling me that something like Jarrett two um, or ABP two are activating, and they seem to be competing for histones, for binding to the complex. So let me, one of the things that we know from people that have done you know, in vivo studies is that Jarrett 2 it is important to start uh, the methylation process. Okay, so for the complex to come, when the, it's coming to, to a certain uh, genome location, and there is, there is no, so very early in, in development, where it, it has to establish a new silence region. And there is no um, pre-existent methylation present for activation. It's known that JARES2 is very important. So it makes sense that in that point, you have an activation event that allows the complex to be able to engage new histones um, and activate them. For, for ABP2, I'd, one of my ideas is just based on the distances from the active site and the RBAP48 is that, you know, it may be that ABP2 is binding to a site that otherwise would be a repressive site that will bind to histone and not allow it to reach uh, the active site. But I, I don't, this is just a speculation based on what we see and the distances between that site and the active site. We cannot be reached simultaneously for the same H3 if it's engaged. But if, if ABP2 binds there, it can't release there. So these cofactors are the ones that are different at different stages in development that are combinatorially expressed in different tissue types. So that comes back to your question. So the way this complex is acting can be regulated but in different by different means, one of them through these cofactors and how they are acting on the complex and competing or not with histones. Yeah. I'm confused. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we all. So because if it's true, yeah. your, your data are provided by the theory, right? Because originally, the assumption was that Tata and less promoters in recruitment of the pigment change complex was enabled by Tata's finding to alternative regulatory elements in the design of the promoter. 
But now your data suggests that what the chaps do is just to get TDP to find DNA of contracting shutdown. I'm, I'm not saying that that is the only, but I'm saying that the motion is something that will facilitate the binding on DNA for which the TBP itself will not necessarily have very high affinity for, and that if it was not directed and positioned, I mean, it's like the whole TF2D, the, the BC core is the right length, it engages of the DPE and the MTE, and it places the Tata position with respect to the initiation, the Tata or pseudo Tata at the right location with respect to the initiator site for the loading of TBP. It's not the only thing. It's not the only thing. I think activators acting through TBP, through TF2D could do other things, recruitment, apart from anything else. Yes. In this I, you know, maybe you have information that I don't have, but in, in we, we're talking about the human complex. There, is an, there are many similarities between, say, Badinghi's and uh, in, in, for the core uh, elements, but there are certain differences, one of which has to do with the fact that human promoters, in, the, in, in human transcription, there's no scanning. So... And there, are, there is very little flexibility between the position of the initiator and the Tata or pseudo Tata and definitely between the initiator and the downstream elements. And that, that agrees. There is a little leeway. And we know, for example, the region that is bounding to the initiator and to the downstream MP, M, uh, DP and, and, and MT uh, is a lobe that is um, of tough one that is connected through a link that could accommodate just, you know, uh, one or two bases of distance in that direction. And on this side, you know, there's also a certain flexibility. I mean, I'm positioning TBP, but if you went one or two bases up or down, it could still be, uh, that local concentration will still be in place. And there is not much variability in human core promoters beyond plus or minus two, three bases. No, that's for yeast. I think, I think we're going to stop. The, the, the transcription start site is always in the initiator in human. Okay. So we'll be doing the session.